weathering the storm, but also her work to support female entrepreneurs during this critical time. Um, I'm really excited. Um, with Sarah because she is, uh, if you haven't seen her Instagram story earlier today, she has taken a family road trip. Um, she, oh, there you are, Sarah. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How I, are I, you? I, I am good. I saw earlier today um, that you said that you might make Forbes history as our only, um, or the, the, the first Instagram live, or probably the first any interview we've done um, from an RV park. Um, so welcome, um, and thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you. I am in the RV right now, in the middle of an RV trailer park, and um, the lady just came up and said, you know you have to leave your spot by noon. And I was like, oh my God, yeah. well, interview, can I have 20 more minutes? She said, no problem. So apparently there's someone else coming into our spot. <laughs> so okay. so at least you, at least you found a, a good RV spot. I just have to start by asking you, you have four kids under the age of 10. So many of us are going stir crazy in our houses. I have two kids and like, I literally find myself hiding in the garage. The idea of going on a road trip in an RV and being even in closer quarters kind of just like blows my mind. Um, <laughs> what inspired you guys to do that? Well, listen, I know it does seem insane. It was like we had to take our quarantine up a notch, right? Like being in a house just the, wasn't- The ultimate, the ultimate, yeah. The ultimate. Um, you know, I think that, you know, and this is something I talk about just about, you know, in crisis and in times where, um, you know, there's a lot of just uncertainty and stress. Um, my, my husband and I got together and we just said, what are, in this situation that we're in, are there any spontaneous things that we could do and still feel like we could remain safe? And this was at the top of the list. And so it's just given us an opportunity to have a change of scenery, which sometimes with four small kids is nice. We go to different RV parks, they ride their bikes all around and there's different things that we do. We'll fish and things like that. So um, it is, it is, it is a little crazy at times, though. I got to say, like, right before you, this You call... had never owned an RV before. I, I loved it. For anyone who doesn't follow Sarah, the adventures on the road, um, literally, like, I just have to say, like, you bring my family and I such a joy um, watching everything from you pumping the gas um, to just, like, <laughs> figuring out how to back out of a, back out of a, a parking lot. Well, the whole the one thing I hope I'm doing for families across America is making them feel more normal and like they really have their act together because watching our families should make you feel that way. <laughs> um, well, no, I think all of us sort of need, you know, I was talking to friends, I think we were saying we feel like a failure every day because um, things are so crazy. So it's nice to kind of have those moments of levity and see how other people are doing, doing it. Speaking of that, I, I want to talk about, you've been such a champion of small biz businesses, entrepreneurs who are the backbone of, of this country. Before we talk about some of the advice you have for um, those people on weathering the storm, just walk us a, a through a little bit in terms of what you've been doing at Spanx, but also the steps that you've taken um, to really get your arms around the crisis, but also as someone who's sort of pivoted so often in, in your career and your business, how people should think, be thinking about steps at this moment in time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is a um, really unprecedented time for everyone. And uh, I kind of went through steps, Moira, when this happened. And the first thing I thought about was my people. How do I keep my people safe and how do I communicate with them? And I think when you're going through an uncertain time and crisis, over communicating is really important. And so Spanx has had, you know, all company calls routinely. We've had many, many touch bases where people are getting together formally and informally virtually. And um, I say this, but I believe during crisis, it's actually a really good time to build culture because people will remember what you do for them in these moments and reaching out and making them feel um, heard and connected and over communicating is one of the ways that you can really build culture. So that was the first thing where, how are my people? The second thing was obviously where can we cut costs and how can we be really prudent about costs right now? I, I tell uh, small businesses and even now that Spanx is 20 years down the road, um, one of the things that I've done that has really been helpful is a zero-based budget. So every single year, every leader has to start at zero and build their budget and um, make a case, an RO the ROI for everything they want to spend. And that has helped us 
be very, very, you know, Spanx has never taken any outside capital ever. And it's 20 years and the $5,000 that I put into Spanx is what has just propelled it all these years um, from the start. And so I think there's a lot to be said about being smart with product and filling white space, but there's a whole other part of the equation, which is spend and cost and how you're managing that. The other thing was I'm a heavy inventory business. So I tell small businesses right now, really look at your inventory. As soon as the crisis started happening here, we assessed inventory. We started talking to all of our manufacturing partners and saying to them, how can we manage this together? And what's going to, what's going to be the right solution for not only you guys, but for us. And um, we completely reevaluated inventory and inventory is a tricky one, Moira, because there's so much unknown. So like we're trying mm -hmm. to it's a moving back. target every day. It's a moving target. So we're trying to scale back some of the inventory, obviously, that we had ordered it almost eight, you know, six months ago um, for this fall. But we also want to have enough, you know, to sell. And so I think that's just a, a fine line that each entrepreneur needs to sit with leaders in their organization and really talk out. And then, um, of course, you know, there's a uh, product, you know, pivoting. I've seen a lot of businesses pivot right now and get really smart. Um, thankfully, Spanx pivoted a while ago and we, we make comfortable leggings and we make a lot of comfortable clothes. And I think that's really key right now. People are wanting to be at home and be comfortable in what they're wearing. Um, but I would say look for the hidden blessings and the hidden opportunities for sure right now. You always uh, so often say that um, sort of uh, entrepreneurs need, are great at turning challenges into opportunities. And you talked about the importance now as a moment to build culture, but also to foster innovation. One of the things I thought was really interesting is you talked about in one of your weekly calls with, with you know, the entire company, you said you want a new product idea from everyone, whether it be someone who's a receptionist in logistics and senior management. How should be pe people be thinking about unlocking those opportunities? Because right now, you know, we're, we're just getting our arms around the crisis. But when you don't can't see up from down um, and you have no idea when the storm is going to end, how can you try to find those positives and infuse that in your culture? Well, I think for the innovation piece, asking is just a big key. I mean, you know, I did ask every employee and the list that I got is incredible. And I'm still only halfway through the list of ideas and many, many of them we will end up implementing um, that are things that I hadn't thought of or the people in our product department hadn't thought of. So um, I would say, you know, kind of, you know, each person hunkers down in crisis on their specialty inside of the organization, but sit and think of what are the general things? Like, are there improvements on process inside of the organization? A lot of businesses are scrambling to keep up. You know, Spanx has been growing rapidly for years, and it's oftentimes we are not able to take the time to improve process. So even asking blanket questions across the organization, do you see any inefficiencies? Where can we be more productive? How can we do things better? And I like to solicit that from everybody, even if it's, if it's an idea on how to improve things not in their department. So soliciting that for innovation as well as improving process has been really key. So sort of use this moment intentionally. For those of us who, who are just joining us, I'm with Sarah Blakely, uh, founder and CEO of, of Spanx. Um, Sarah, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of your previous experiences in terms of crisis moments. Um, you officially launched Spanx um, in 2000, right before 9-11. Um, and obviously that, that was a, a really profound event in your business. And sometimes I've, I've heard from entrepreneurs that in times like this, especially sort of this moment in time in, in the retail environment, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to con connect with, with my customers. Everything that I've known is now changing. Talk a little bit about what you learned from navigating through 9-11 and how people can think about adapting that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 9-11, as you said, happened the year after I launched Spanx. And um, when I sold Spanx into Neiman, Saks, Nordstrom, Bloomingdale's, and all the, the major department stores, um, I realized very quickly, Moira, that I needed to sell it for them. <laughs> I think a lot of entrepreneurs get the big order and they might make a mistake and think I've arrived. That is when I worked the hardest. So getting a chance to be in those department stores, 
pre-internet and pre, you know, really all this online selling, um, it was the holy grail and I didn't want to mess it up. So I went and stood in every store and sold from around 8.30 in the morning until seven at night every day for two wow. years. And wow, nine two years. years. Two years yeah, you were hustling in store. Every day I sold wow. for them. Because I knew if I let my fate be dependent on people that work hourly in a hosiery department at a department store, I mean, they might, they're not going to be as passionate about this as I am. And I want to not, I didn't want my success to be in other people's hands as much as I could. And so I did, I took two years and basically sold it. And I promise you, Moira, if I didn't do that, Neiman's would have returned Spanx about three to six months later and said, it didn't work. I know it, I know it, you know, because it would have sat in the corner of a shelf, hoping that somebody was selling it and explaining it and, and no one, it wouldn't have worked. So um, I did, I spent two years every day on the road and 9-11 um, happened and I thought, oh, wait, so, and everyone's like, there's no one in the stores, don't go, don't go do your Spanx days, as they were called. And in crisis, I also tell people, just keep going, just how, keep moving. How how do you get that motivation to just keep moving, right? Because you, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're hearing no's right and left. People are doubting your ideas. You know, it is a roller coaster ride every single day. Um, and in a crisis, all the more, all the more so. What's your advice and how did you really learn how to keep moving, but also harness and cultivate whatever it was inside you to keep plotting those steps forward? Well, I'll tell you, for me personally, sitting still feels worse. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just, I have to be in forward motion. It gives me, it makes me calmer. It makes me feel better. Um, I like the feeling of being productive. So right after 9-11 happened, I continued my Spanx days, even though no one was in the store. No one. And I had a few people say to me, Sarah, that's not a good use of your time. What are you did doing? You, did you doubt that personally? I did when people said that to me, you know, because people were far more experienced than I was. And they said, this isn't the best use of your time. I even had this very distinguished looking man shopping with his wife at a Neiman's. And they were interacting with me at one point. And he said, everyone always thought I was the paid model or the paid spokesperson for the brand. And then like sometimes halfway through the pitch or later after they bought it, they would figure out or some other sales associate would say, no, she owns the company. And this guy came back to me and he goes, you're the owner of this company. And I go, yes, I am. And you know, look what it does for your butt. <laughs> and, um, and he just said, and you have nothing better to do than to stand here. And it really caught me off guard because I thought, he looks so much smarter than I do. He's significantly older than I am. And, you know, he looks like he's been very successful. So I'd have those moments, but actually I kept going. And let me tell you what ended up happening. I didn't know this at the time, but because there was nobody in the stores and I was still making the trip every day to go and I would go on Priceline and get a hotel on Priceline and end up staying wherever would bid the lowest, you know, for me to stay. And I'd drive from, from one store to another all across the country. Um, I, I built a sales force not on my payroll, Moira, because I was in the store when there weren't a lot of customers and I got deep relationships with all the other sales associates that sold shoes, that sold makeup, that sold the couture dresses. And after I would visit that store for the day, they all ended up selling Spanx for me in their departments. And so, you know, that was a huge positive and win. And I look back at that and I'm like, I wasn't really sure if I was doing the right thing, but I was honoring my gut and I was keeping moving. Like in crisis, I say, keep going forward. We've gotten a couple of questions um, from our audience around, you know, is oh, the And I've gotten a couple of people, questions from people around um, whether now is time, time to start a business. Um, you may have been laid off or unsure about your, your future. You know, I was always struck by your story because you um, talk about the fact that you didn't have traditional experience. You didn't have a huge network, a big bank account, um, a Rolodex to call on, and a lot of experience in that sector. Um, when people are thinking about starting a business, what should be that frame of mind when they go into it, even during a pandemic? I think if you've got a good product, don't pay too much attention to the macro environment. I mean, I never did. I never did. So 
Don't get caught up in it's a good time, it's a bad time. If you've got a good product, and this is what entrepreneurs are known for, they invent something or create something that didn't exist that we all need, or they take something and make it better than it was. And if you're anchored in either one of those buckets, it doesn't matter when you start it. You know, it's, there's no wrong time to start a product that's great and a service that's great. So uh, that's, that's how I felt. I mean, I was really quite oblivious to what was happening in the ups and downs, even throughout the, the 20 years. I just kept laser focused on what I knew I could provide to the customer and how I was uniquely different and how we were uniquely positioned among the competition in our space. Well, I think that's great advice because especially over the past few years, I think there's been a sense from entrepreneurs or people starting businesses that if it isn't huge, if there isn't scale, if I don't go out with guns blazing, um, I'm not going to have necessarily successful business. But I think, you know, you talking about is a reminder of just sort of keeping taking those steps forward and you don't necessarily need to take that traditional path um, is, is so paramount. Um, I want to switch gears because... I think you raised something important there. Um, it's okay to start small, you know. I think why is that? Why why do you think people got have gotten so sort of hung up on on the big scale? I think it's it's a, it's like seductive. It's appealing. I think people like almost like a badge of honor, like to talk about how how fast they grew, how many employees they have, and. I never looked at it that way. I mean, I was always so focused on the customer. And so my, my business grew as I could serve her. You know, like if I came up with a new idea or the team did, that, that was what I was really interested in. And I think it's really important to start small, think big, and scale fast. Um, you'll know when you need to scale fast. And I tell people, you know, if, 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 you, if being first to market is ultimately so incredibly important to what you're doing, then that's a time you want to sit down and say, does it make sense to bring in a lot of extra money and be able to move quicker? But I, I just didn't do that. I didn't choose that path. And I think that um, I've seen a lot of those businesses, as I'm sure you have too, that grow huge and then burn out, you know, and, yeah. and after a couple of years or the entrepreneur loses so much of their own business along the way or of their own dreams. So just think people got to be a little careful about just growth for the sake of growth. And, 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 and that there are many, there are many roads to take to become a successful founder. Um, you've done, and something that I have so admired is you've really been an extraordinary supporter of female entrepreneurs um, in a variety of different ways um, and empowering their growth and opportunities for them. And most recently during this pandemic, um, you uh, did an extraordinary thing, a $5 million grant. Um, you mentioned earlier that you started Spanx with $5,000 and you're giving 1,000 female founders $5,000 to help get them through this challenging time. Talk a little bit about the inspiration for that, but also why you feel it's so important to invest in female founders, but also the role that we all can play in small and big ways in this moment in time to support each other. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, entrepreneurs are the backbone of our community. I am so passionate about entrepreneurs. Um, I am a small business owner. I've been a small business owner. I still act like a small business owner even 20 years later. So I feel a deep connection to other entrepreneurs and especially during a time of crisis. So I did want to reach out. I did want to help. And women in general are underserved in um, funding. And so I feel really good about being able to target women potentially and help them. So yes, a uh, thousand different women will get $5,000 each from the Red Backpack Fund, Moira. And I named it Red Backpack Fund because I started Spanx with my lucky red backpack from college. And it was with me almost every day for the first seven years of Spanx. I never carried a purse. I always had this dingy red backpack and like all the fancy Neemans and Bergdorf. And, you know, all my friends you were always- Stay true to yourself. Me. Yeah, everybody was always begging me like, Sarah, you gotta get a Prada bag, return it the next day, whatever you need to do. And I was like, no, 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 this red backpack's lucky. And so now it's hanging framed in the headquarters at Spanx, but each woman will also get her own lucky red backpack when she receives the 5,000 from the Red Backpack Fund. And it's really just about remembering that everything you need is right there already on your back. And to start small, dream big. And, um, and so Spanx, 
Spanx has been, you know, Spanx for me, I've known since I was a little girl that I wanted to help women. I think the passion comes from seeing my mom and my grandmother's limited choices. And I think, I believe I absorbed that as a little girl. It wasn't really talked about in my house. I didn't grow up in a house that was like, we got to help women or pro women. I actually think just watching quietly, my mom sort of gets smaller and sort of limit herself and my grandmothers and seeing that they were such impressive women. And um, I was, I was frustrated that they didn't have more options. So I feel so lucky that I was born in the right place at the right time and whatever I can do in my lifetime to help other women, I really want to do it. A couple of quick, quick questions before we wrap up, you know, you, um, as I said, like, one of my favorite people on, on Instagram, you live your life as a mother of four young kids so openly and authentically. Share sort of a, a, a funny story of you guys on the road, but also why you've taken that approach to sort of show people the, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, the messy, um, because that is, that is what life is. Um, but not a lot of people in your position um, often take that, that same approach. And any advice you have for sort of us parents sort of navigating the crazy quarantine, um, personally, <laughs> I, I could really value um, as, as, as I get a little more frayed at the edges with each and every minute. Well, you know, I think, I mean, I've just, I just am who I am. I just have always, I have not felt any different from any success that I've experienced. I still feel like the exact same person. Um, I also will say collectively, I feel like being really successful needed a better rap. <laughs> like, I think that a lot of successful people and, you know, it doesn't look super appealing sometimes, you know, they're like a lot of times serious in pictures. They don't look like they're smiling. They don't look like they have any flaws or issues. So I wanted this to be able to like show how, how I am just like a lot of other people and that if someone can see something in me, whether my RV is a total mess and mm -hmm. serious everywhere. And my, my daughter, like you asked what happened, my daughter, I would took my eyes off her for a little bit and she gave herself a full blown mullet, like a <laughs> mullet. <laughs> Thank wow. Here and here. So um, she, she went retro. <laughs> I mean, she and Linda Ronstadt, I put a picture of them side by side. I think that that look should come back actually. But, um, Anyway, it's it's just it, it's important to me, especially as a woman, to show other women that like you know I'm flawed. I got a lot of issues. I'm figuring it out as I go, and I want to inspire them to believe in themselves and to do it, and not feel like it's this separate thing that someone has to have 12 degrees and know all the right people and have their life completely together to do something like this. Um, and then you know I think just quarantining with kids. Oh my gosh, it has been. I have ups and downs. I, I lock myself in the closet a lot to take calls. <laughs> I mean, right. I yeah, where, all where, where are they right now? Oh, yeah. I had to dr bribe all of my children with popsicles to be outside of the RV right now so I could be in here by myself. Uh -huh. And my husband is with them. So he's being a trooper. Yeah, my, my husband is literally driving my kids around the block. I feel like it looks like it, the neighbors, they weren't this time. They think we're like Casey in the neighborhood in, in like a black outback because like literally he's going around the block about 50 times. Um, but you got to do what you got to do. And if only this conversation could be four hours, or at least I could tell him it was four hours. Um, so I could ask like, this is like the, the, the most quiet my house has been um, in about eight weeks. So I, I appreciate that. Before we wrap up, Sarah, one um you know, as, as entrepreneurs are, are inspired by this conversation, but and small business owners and all of us, but going back to, you know, the realities of the grind, um, what's your one last piece of advice you have for them um, around harnessing that optimism and positivity that you've talked about? Well, I, I work on my positive mindset daily. I mean, I think it's your greatest asset as an entrepreneur. It gets you through the good times and the bad times. So for me, Wayne Dyer is a motivational, inspirational speaker that I've been listening to since I was 16 years old. I also love Tony Robbins. And then there's so many great, you know, new, you know, people coming up that are now out there in that space. So I try to um, make sure that I have that in my daily life, whether it means I listen to it on Instagram, I follow a lot of positive quote um, 
accounts. I like that popping up in my feed. So it's just, that's deeply important. And then another thing I would say is just focus on what, what is your why? You know, when you are really connected to your why and your purpose, um, it'll get you through the, it'll get you through the hard times and you'll be braver than you ever thought. Like, for example, you know, I ask my, I say there's three main questions to ask. What am I good at? Um, what brings me joy and how can I best serve the world? And then um, focus on those. And when I do do that, I find that I can be braver. Like for me, I'm passionate about women. I'm wanting to elevate women on the planet. I think there's a big imbalance between the masculine and feminine energy on the planet. I believe that when that's more balanced, there will be a, a greater, we will all benefit. The greater whole will benefit. Um, so that's what I want to do in my lifetime. And Having that greater purpose gives me the courage to walk through the door of the account that I'm scared to call on. It gives me courage and it gives me the motivation to keep going when times get so tough. If I had been doing this just for myself, Moira, I would have quit a long time ago. Well, I love that advice, the, the why to anchor you through all of this. Um, and and thank you for, for opening up your RV. Um, selfishly, I'm... I'm, I'm Really happy you did it. I'm trying to convince my brother and sister-in-law to pick me up. We're here down in Florida to pick me up in an RV to go back to my parents. So if there's any plug that you could be, you could you could give them to like because they love you and they love your husband. Oh Can my you gosh, just like, do it, do it. I'm gonna show you, Moira. You Ooh, we're getting the it. RV tour. I love this. <laughs> this is the RV, and there are my kids playing with sticks. <laughs> Have you? Um, are you the, the driver? Where's my like, husband? <laughs> hey, Jesse. Um, he, gets, he gets extra credit for uh, keeping the kids sort of safe. Sort um, of safe. And have you done any of the driving? Are you behind the wheel? I did. I did yesterday. I drove several hours, and it was it wasn't bad. It wasn't who bad. does? Who gets the least glamorous task of like cleaning um, out those? My husband cleans out the septic tank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that is a good husband. You chose well. <laughs> you chose well. Uh, that is yeah that is like the one like you know a little like angst to have that RV living but I'm glad that you're giving it like a you know high praise because I, I literally need my brother-in-law and sister to come pick us up um so um <laughs> do it do it do it it's thank great. you it's you've fun. sold us um and uh and again thank you Sarah for those words of insight and inspiration um we're wishing you and your family health during this time um but really appreciate you taking the, the precious time as as a business owner operator a mom of four and just doing all that you do to share this insight with our audience and uh, be well. And we look forward to your RV adventures, your business adventures, and uh, all the work that you're doing to support women and entrepreneurs in the weeks and months ahead. So safe driving, Sarah, and we'll see you hopefully on the road. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Moira. Thank Bye, you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.